Hello, welcome to the webinar, NPS Everywhere, The Competitive Advantage of a Customer-Obsessed Culture, sponsored by Ask Nicely. I'm Paula Bernier, and I'll be helping out with the polls and Q&A today. We'll have speakers today from Ask Nicely, Zapproved, and Fleetio. And Ask Nicely's uh, Leah Cheney will be leading the discussion. Leah, the floor is yours. All right, well, everybody, first, thank you so much for uh, for listening today. Uh, we're really excited to talk about my favorite subject, which is uh, customer obsession. Uh, we've all heard the importance of having a customer-centric culture in our business, so today we're going to talk about what that actually means. Uh, so we'll talk with our panel, which includes Michelle and Wendy, and we'll be going over tangible evidence on how this works. So with that said, I want to do a round table starting with Michelle to kind of introduce yourself and then we'll go to Wendy. Um, my name is Michelle Rook. I am the manager of our customer success operations team at Zapproved. We cover all of our customer engagement, which includes MPS as well as internal and external training. And I'm Wendy Pochup. I'm the customer success director at Fleetio, where we help organizations track, analyze, and improve their fleet operations. Awesome, and my name is Leah Cheney. I am the VP of Customer Success with Ask Nicely. And we also have Paula, who you met earlier, that's gonna be helping us as well. So that being said, let's jump on in. Um, we have our first poll question that is coming up that Paula's gonna take over. Great, thanks so much, Leah. So uh, this is our first poll question. As, as Leah said, if the audience members could weigh in now with a quick yes or no answer, that would be great. The question, as you should be able to see, is do you currently have an MPS program? Um, do you, yes uh, or, or not? Um, and uh, this is gonna be the first of three poll questions uh, today during today's webinar. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, push out the results. Leah, do you have any thoughts on these results? Yeah, you know, I'm really, I'm really interested in to see it. I, I'm gonna guess that most people do have uh, a, an MPS program, but I'm ready to see the results. Oh wow, okay, so 65%, I, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty good. So not most people, uh, but it's definitely a metric that we're starting to look at. Um, you know, I think that uh, for me, it's easy to say that MPS is the is the catalyst, right? Like since I work for a company that does it. Um, but I'd love to hear, uh, maybe starting with Michelle, what are your thoughts on this poll? Are you kind of are you kind of surprised by the overall numbers? Were you expecting more? I was expecting more. It's approved. We've been doing the MPS. Uh, we've had an MPS program since 2010 in place. So we're coming up on eight years of having a program that's been in place. I mean, we've iterated on iterated on it since then, but it's it's been core to our company for almost as long as we've been around. That was awesome. How about you, Wendy? Um, I was actually surprised um, to see that that many people had an NPS program. Um, NPS is new for Fleetio. We're about um, a year in with our program. Um, and I came from an environment where we didn't have an NPS program, so I'm excited to see that so many people are implementing one. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that we are seeing more and more of it for sure, uh, and that's definitely part of why we're talking about this is how we can get, you know, some of the leading uh, companies across the globe are using NPS. Companies like Apple, uh, and then definitely startups. It's that tangible tangible score that you're able to take and and do something with, right? So. Uh, that's the big thing that we're going over today. Uh, we're going to go over what MPS is. Uh, so I know that we all talked about it with the, the acronym of MPS, but it stands for no, Net Promoter Score. Um, we're going to dig into the basics. So we'll go into the basic math behind what MPS is, uh, a little bit of information about how it started. Um, also, I think it'd be interesting for those of us here to speak a little bit on the misconceptions, um, different ways that people are collecting the net promoter score and looking at the numbers wrong, all right? So we'll go into that a little bit. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about mainly how it's gone from this boardroom metric to a key company metric where it's across the entire organization. Uh, so I know here at Ask Nicely, we're, um, you know, MPS is our DNA, of course, and I'll be talking about how we use it 
not only in customer success, but also in marketing and sales and, you know, all the way around every unit of the business up into the C-suite and beyond. Um, and then I'd love to get some insight, of course, from Wendy and Michelle, how their organizations are using it, it as well. Uh, so that's what we'll look at. We'll talk about some of the basics, uh, and then we'll get into some of the more advanced portions of it as well. So that being said, um, I want to kind of start with what the Net Promoter Score is. So basically, what MPS is, is the question to end all questions. So in the most basic terms, it's a simple way of measuring and taking action on customer feedback. So I'll keep the history lesson short, since we're not here for a history lesson, but basically the origin of it, of the Net Promoter Score, dates back to 2003, uh, so not quite the Stone Ages, just a few years back, uh, when Fred Rickard, uh, a partner of Bain & Company, uh, invented the framework altogether. So essentially, he wanted what all great business owners want, right? Like a way to measure and take action on the customer happiness overall. So fast forward to today, and some of the most successful companies globally, uh, as I mentioned before, are using MPS for the same purpose. Uh, so anywhere from your, uh, you know, baby startup of just in a few employees to some of your larger uh you know, global organizations uh, like Apple and, and other companies about that size. So I think that the big thing in addition to the history and what MPS stands for is it's simple, right? Uh, keep it simple uh, is the framework to help understand the customer and make decisions. Um, so here we have on this slide just an example of how you would see an end user, so the customer of Jarvis Air would see Net Promoter Score uh, on their mobile device, perhaps, um, and what that would look like. So just a simple zero to 10 scale that you see there. Now for the math, which is uh, definitely not my favorite subject. I would definitely say I was more of a theater uh, guru. Uh, but luckily for me, the, the math behind that promoter score is actually pretty simple. Um, so for a simple breakdown, you have three customer groups. Um, and based on their MPS score, they fall into these three categories. So the fat, first category is your zero to six score, which is your detractors, right? That's the sad face that you see there. Uh, these are the unhappy customers that nobody wants to have. Uh, they're likely to speak unfavorably of your brand, um, possibly not renew, uh, and other things that we absolutely want to avoid in a customer-centric environment. Uh, your next group is seven and eight, uh, and those are your passives, right? Uh, these are customers that are relatively neutral about their brand, about your brand, rather. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more to passives later, but I feel like these are your highlight room for improvement and big focal points uh, when you get these scores as well. And then finally, you have nine and ten, which is your promoters. And these are your huge smiley face, right? These are the customers that love you. Uh, they're ready to be advocates for you. Um, you can sit comfortable at night knowing that they're probably going to renew. Uh, and there's a lot of opportunity there, right? Like this is where you can bring in your marketing team for potential case studies. Uh, this is where you can bring in your sales team and your CS team for potential expansion and more opportunities. Uh, and really, they're just your advocates that are going to speak well on your brand. So to get the score, so let's talk about the math for a second. Basically, you take the percentage of promoters, so your total percentage of promoters, and you minus the percentage of detractors. And that is where you get your MPS score. Um, so one big common mistake that is really painful for me to watch, and to be completely honest with you, a big mistake that I made uh, when I first started leading CS organizations and looking at MPS is looking at the score like it's a grade scale system, right? So like, let's say you have a 70, for example, for your MPS score. Um, you don't want to look at that like it's a zero to 100, because don't forget, there's a zero in there on your calculating MPS scores. So you could be in the negatives. So 70 is actually a fantastic score. It's not a C. Uh, so I think when you're bringing these out, that's one of the key things you want to keep in mind when you're getting buy-in across the company is really educating them on the simple math. And to be honest with you, this little graph here with the smiley face and the, the frowning face that breaks it down is, is a pretty easy way to do that. 
Um, so discussing the score, before I move on to the next slide, I do just want to open it up. Michelle, have you had uh, on your side, have you seen any other uh, ways that maybe people misrepresented an MPS score or any challenges with calculating that? Um, I think another misrepresentation that I've seen is averaging the scores. So if you have, you know, uh, five tens and five nines and five eights, taking that average instead of calculating it based on those percentages of promoters and passives and detractors. So I think that's probably the biggest misrepresentation that I've seen while working in customer success. Fantastic. How about you, Wendy? Um, now, I think when we launched here at Fleetio, one of the um, sort of educational points that we had to make was exactly what you said. It's not a grade scale. So, um, you know, a 58 isn't a D or an F. <laughs> like, it, uh, you know, it appears like it could be. So just some education around that. So if you get a 58 and didn't just fail your customer exam is basically what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank goodness. All right. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. All right. So uh, moving right along. Uh, I do want to just let you guys know I got some great feedback on some of the images being blurry. So just to let the audience know, this is all um, a downloadable PDF. So if you're having challenges seeing it, uh, feel free to download that um, as well. Uh, so sorry about the blurry images there. So moving right along, I'm going to pass this back over to Paula now, who is going to give us our next poll question. Thanks so much. Um, so as you can see, uh, the question is, what best describes your current MPS program? If audience members could weigh in now, that would be great. Uh, this one is not a yes/no. It's a little harder, but I think you can do it. Uh, the answers are: Do you have an uh, you have an MPS program, but you don't use the program to improve results? You have an MPS program and try to use it to improve performance, but you can't quantify the ROI on MPS? Or do you have an MPS program that's operationally integrated? and that you can measure impact and ROI for. Um, do you have MPS uh, it, it's a, as an important part of your organization and focus and, and you use it to create raving fans for your company if you do good for you? Or have you not yet implemented an MPS program? Uh, again, if you could weigh in now, that would be just great. And while we're waiting for the answers to come in, I wanted to mention that there will be a Q&A at the end of this webinar. Um, but if uh, audience members have questions that come up at any time during the webinar, they can feel free to go ahead and input them onto the platform at any time. And as I mentioned, I'll read those questions to our presenters uh, following the discussion. So let me uh, go ahead and uh, show the results. Okay, the results are up. Leah, do you want to take a look and, and share your thoughts with us? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I'm actually not too surprised with this one um, on on if you have one or not and, and how you're doing with it, right? It looks like 4% are coming in as you have an MPS program, but you don't use the program to improve results. Okay, so full disclaimer, like I said, I've been running customer success for a while, and the first thing I did was fail at MPS. So love that I'm sitting on the other side of that now, but this is something I think we're definitely going to be able to help you with. Since you're collecting the scores, what do you do with it? Um, and I'm really excited to also share at the end of this with uh, Michelle and Wendy uh, some of how their organizations are using it as well. Um, so it looks like the majority, just squeaking in there, 28% have an MPS program, and they try to use it to improve performance, but they cannot quantify an ROI for MPS. That's totally fair. Um, again, it, I think that uh, going back to how it was historically set up um, and just looking at the numbers, uh, if you're just looking at a number and you're not doing a lot of actionable stuff with it, then yeah, absolutely, you're not getting a return on your investment. So I think this is where having MPS everywhere in the DNA of your organization throughout the entire company um, really helps increase that return on investment. Um, if you use NPS correctly, right, like, and you're able to take those scores and decrease um, your returns, if that's applicable, applicable to your business, or improve um, the customer satisfaction that leads to expansion opportunities, or even to the advocacy of collateral, like case studies, et cetera, that's where that number value is going to start to increase. Um, so it looks like the next percentage there is 4% with have an NPS program that is operationally integrated, um, and we can measure the impact of ROI. Okay, hopefully that wasn't just me. Just kidding. I wasn't. I wasn't actually uh, voting in on that. 
Uh, but it sounds like those are those are the people that we really want uh, in an ideal scenario that that be our front runner, that these are the people that are really seeing the impact of it. Uh, and then our next uh, second place there is 24% of, of users have an MPS or it has become an important part of how you focus on your customer and create raving fans for the company. So perhaps just a little push for, uh, further would get, uh, get you even more value there. And then, uh, oh, I apologize. The number, the number one is actually 40% of that have no NPS program at all. Well, the good news is it came to the right place because everybody on this webinar is definitely using NPS. Uh, and it's something is, uh, that, it's super simple to get started. I mean, you could actually set an NPS score out at the end of this afternoon if you wanted to. Uh, so we'll talk about the, some of the simplicity of getting that up and running as well. Um, so let me go ahead and go this time to Wendy. Wendy, what are your thoughts on the poll here? So um, I actually feel like um, most people probably are where we're at, which is between the um, ability to use it to improve performance, um, we've definitely got a lot of actionable uh, playbooks and, and workflows that we have built off of our NPS feedback. Um, and we're just starting to scratch the surface of being able to quantify that ROI. So, um, it, and it's really quick to get there. I mean, I would say we launched our NPS program um, about a year ago, and initially, you know, we were just sort of watching the numbers and collecting that feedback, and we've gone, um, you know, from that basic step to really having it integrated throughout our organization, um, you know, in all of our teams um, in less than a year. So, easy to do. That's fantastic. Uh, Michelle, how about you? You want to weigh in on this one? Um, I would say we're probably right about where Wendy is. Uh, we There are definitely some really great ways that we can quantify the ROI of MPS promoters, especially. Um, I don't think we do as good of a job as quantifying um, how tractors impact the business, um, but we're working to get there. So we're right about where Wendy is. At first, we spent a lot of time just watching the numbers roll in and looking at them and gathering feedback. And, and now we're really starting to take super actionable insights that our, our customer success managers can, can go back to the customer with all across the board. Okay, that makes total sense. Um, you know, for us, of course, again, um, you know, MPS is obviously uh, what our – uh, platform does. Uh, so at the end of the day, we are we are very obsessed with it, right? Um, we have uh, we have a dashboard that actually has lifetime results of all of the feedback that we get from our NPS scores from all our customers across the board uh, in real time. Uh, we've actually have these um, throughout both of our offices, so our Portland, Oregon office as well as our Auckland office, uh, just really large TVs where everybody in the company can see these NPS scores come through. Uh, and it's exciting, right? Like you get a good score and you look around and you see each department kind of jumping up and, and uh, you know, being excited to see a customer that maybe they sold, uh, that maybe they, you know, fixed a, a, a product issue or added a feature uh, coming in at a 10. I mean, it's just this, you know, exciting thing that you feel across the room. Uh, and then the same thing for those detractors, right? When we get somebody that's not happy with it, it's, it's uh, you know, it's interesting to me as, as the head of CS, it asks nicely, I'm the one that responds to these. Uh, but oftentimes, before I can even get to it, I've got uh, somebody on the product team that's, that's chiming in with a recommendation of what we can do to help. I have somebody on the sales side that's maybe saying, hey, this is, this is something that, that we're seeing with, uh, with people coming on board is that they want to see this. And, and so that's really how you get it into the DNA is when you're taking the score and doing something with it, right? Uh, and the joke I like to tell everyone is, I kind of wish I had this for everybody. Like every interaction I had, I wish I knew from zero to 10 how happy they were with me, right? Uh, that might sound like a, you know, like a, a little much at times, but I think that if, if you use the scores correctly, uh, it's really something that can help shift your culture and, and shift how your company operates on a daily basis. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much for chiming in on that. Let's go ahead and move on to our next uh, section of the webinar which is kind of digging more into the details, right? Like, let's talk about the catalyst for a customer obsession uh, and what those elements look like. So, for example, um, for me, when I look over this, it's all about the before and the after, right? So it's like you're listening and, and then you're empathizing. Like, first got to listen before you can empathize. Uh, example of this would be 
sometimes when we get, um, for example, this happened to me the other day. Um, I had a four come in, so of course I'm, I'm high attention on the on the NPS score, and it was a customer that was frustrated that they couldn't do something with the product and that we should build that. The catch was the product did that. So if I would have just empathized first and gone directly to our product team without looking into it further, then you know I would have I would have missed this opportunity in real time when a customer needs something to jump on and be like, hey, let's work through this. You can actually do this right now. Uh, so again, it's listening and then empathizing and, and doing something actionable with that. Uh, and then also gaining insight uh, and being proactive. This is the big thing I tell my team, right? Like we have to be proactive. It can't be reactive. Uh, if we want to be successful as a, as a team, as a company, as an individual performer, you need to be able to proactively use the insight that you get from your NPS score. Uh, and then there's also the next level sense of urgency, right? Being able to, again, have that temperature check of how serious things are. Uh, and then finally, deliver the optimal experience at every touch point. Um, so I'd love at this point to kind of mix things up. I'm going to go over to Michelle first. Uh, Michelle, if you don't mind, um, looking over some of the bullet points we have there, does anything stand out to you as something that you have uh, insight into that you've experienced with NPS? Um, I, well, first, I think listening and empathy are core competencies of customer success as a whole. I don't think it just extends to the net promoter score. Um, so those obviously resonate with me very much. I've spent many a miles walking in my customer's shoes. Um, but for, for me, really, it's next level sense of urgency. Um, I'm a huge believer in following up with everybody every single time. Uh, the, the, net, the MPS doesn't mean anything if you don't follow up on what your customers are saying, um, even if they're not saying anything. If they just give you a three and leave no reason why, it's important to find out why they gave that three um, and what you can do to get them to a six next time and an eighth of time after and finally a ten. Um, you have to be able to follow up every time, and you can't wait two or three weeks to follow up. You you need to have that next level sense of urgency, even if they're promoters, because with promoters, there's a, a huge opportunity there um, to to enhance the relationship and to to showcase a successful partnership. So for me, next level sense of urgency is probably the one that resonates the most. Yeah, that's fantastic and really good, great insight there. I uh, completely agree with you. Uh, it is a lot of, of what you do with it. Um, can you go a little further into maybe ways that you have taken uh, somebody who's, who hasn't given the feedback? Like, what, what would you do if you just got, had a three and, and didn't have a lot there? Would you, like, reach out um, via email or call? Like, what would you do to get more insight there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have a nice, dedicated Slack channel um, at our organization where – Every single response from the NPS is fed into it. Uh, our account executive and our customer success manager for that particular account are uh, made aware that one of their contacts has filled out the net promoter score survey. Um, our customer success managers have playbooks and email templates for every detractor. Uh, and part of that playbook is that they need to get on the call, get on a call with that customer. It can't be something over email. It needs to be on the phone, feel a little bit more personal. Um, and they need to create a remediation plan. Is it, is it problems with the product? Is it problems with the, the survey or the, the support that they're receiving from the company? Where, where is the problem that they're not feeling as though they're getting the most value that they would be willing to recommend us? And then our customer success manager is responsible for closing the feedback loop with the business. So what is the remediation plan? What is the timeline? How are we going to act on it? Um, so for, for detractors, we, uh, we act pretty aggressively, and we have different surveys all across our customer life cycle, and um, we try to be as transparent as possible to the business, especially with regards to remediation of problems. That's fantastic. I'm going to dig just one more time on this just for a little bit more clarity. So when you say get transparency across the organization, so what do you do on that side? Are they on the Slack channel that they're watching uh, these numbers come through, or do you send them kind of a breakdown? And if so, who is, who is getting that breakdown, and how are they getting it? Is it an email like once a week, or just a little bit more clarity into kind of what you do with those metrics? Yeah, of course. So um, our MPS is a rolling NPS. Um, we don't do defined periods. Ours is based on the renewal date of a contract. So we survey someone um, 
X number of months before and after their renewal. So uh, our kind of roles, we don't have things that go out every day or every week. Um, but with that, we the Slack channel is open to anybody in our organization who wants to join. We have engineers that are in it. We have product owners and product managers that are in it. Um, we have our C-suite is in it. Um, our entire customer success team from support, project managers, customer success managers, operations, we're all in it. Sales is in it. Um, but then we also have uh, an email distribution list that's made up of about 20 individuals across our company. It's our entire executive team. It's all of the uh, product team. It's our customer success managers and our account executives. Remediation plans are sent through that uh, that avenue rather than Slack just because it's um, it's a little bit higher priority when it's at the top of the inbox and it says remediation plan than when it gets lost in the Slack channel. Okay, well, I can definitely say that sounds like customer obsession. Uh, so that's fantastic. It's, it's great to hear that you guys do that over at Zapruz. Uh Wendy, anything additionally that uh, you can give everybody insight into, maybe some best practices on your side that you found successful? Uh, we have a process that's very similar to uh, what you all have been mentioning. We have a Slack channel that's dedicated to NPS, and we push all of our results there. Um, again, it's open to the entire company, and I believe um, everybody is a member, um, and it's a very active channel. So as uh, survey results start to come in, um, we do send an, an email uh, to customers, I think, at 10 a.m. Eastern time every morning. So we start to get the feedback right around that time, and that channel gets very active. Product managers will jump on um, product feedback, and I've seen um, conversation between product managers and the, the, the C-level executives about uh, certain pieces of feedback, and I've seen them jump on it and push things out within a matter of days, depending on the kind of product feedback that we're getting. Um, the customer success team is in there, and uh, you know we're uh, jumping all over the things that are related to training, or um, like Leah said, you know the product doesn't do something, um, and so we'll follow up with that. We do have some workflows built out based off of certain responses that we get. Um, so if we do get a, um, a detractor, uh, we do send a workflow email that asks them to schedule a 15-minute call with me. Um, so that I can dig in deeper with them, especially if they don't give feedback with their survey results. Um, if they choose not to schedule that, we do try to do an additional follow-up to get them on the phone with us, um, which in our customer uh, environment sometimes can be very tricky. But we do try to dig as deeply as we possibly can. And then we do um, a monthly recap of our NPS um, based on our segments, um, just digging deep, looking at themes, and uh, coming up with plans for how we can get um, you know, NPS scores for certain areas of business or certain types of customers um, even higher. That's fantastic. <laughs> well, I can definitely say that that is not cookie cutter. Uh, that is a great customer experience and definitely optimal, right? Like I, I want to be a customer where, uh, you know, a, a company cares about me enough to put those that, that level of attention into everything I feel. So I think that's fantastic. Uh, definitely why we uh, wanted to do a webinar with, with both of you that are on the call. Um, so moving on then to the next part of it, which is, again, continuing um, that customer obsession into – driving decision making. Um, so, you know, we've talked a little bit, um, I dug into this kind of advance of this slide uh, with how you've done that differently and what the results are. Um, but here's the big question, and this is actually my favorite question. Um, do your customers know, right? Like if you're putting this much heart and soul and work into what you're doing behind the curtains, how do your customers know that you care that much? Um, and, you know, I think this is something where even myself, there's, there's a lot of room for improvement uh, with everyone that uses NPS on how you can let people know. Um, obviously, if they've gotten a survey, that's step one because they, they know you sent it out. They know you care enough to send that. Um, but, you know, I, I'd love to open it up. And if the answer is, hey, actually, we don't do anything right now, then that's fine uh, because I think a lot of people are in that boat. Um, but you know, starting with you this time, Wendy, do you guys have a way to let customers know you take this, this beyond just the NPS score that they see, that you take this and do something with it? Um, yeah, so our feedback channel, um, actually, as part of the process, we have a feedback loop where we log every piece of feedback that we get with customers, and when we push it out, um, we follow up on the original um, conversation that we had. So customers know if they submit feedback to us via NPS. 
When that feedback gets uh, put into the product, we follow up with them and say thanks again for sharing this through NPS. And um, just wanted to let you know that feature is available for you inside of the product now. And we actually use it as part of our sales process. So with our um, larger enterprise size deals, we share our NPS score with them right up front in the demo process um, as a commitment to them that we take it seriously. And uh, we share with them how our program works and what we're going to do with their, their feedback um, when we get it. That's amazing. Uh, Michelle, any other insight there from, from the Zapruz side of things? Um, I definitely don't think we're as thorough as Wendy, but I might pass along that idea of sharing our MPS during the sales process. I think it's fantastic. I, I, we have an MPS score that I would love to tout to some of our larger um, enterprise deals that are coming down the pipeline. Um, I think that that we definitely probably follow up more with detractors with regards to how feedback has been implemented than with passives we or in promoters. Um, we could certainly do better on the passive than promoters front, if I'm being completely honest. Yeah, that makes total sense. And, you know, again, uh, no judgment there because I think it's something that everybody's still kind of figuring out. I can say with that nicely. Um, obviously, our customers know we do a lot with this because, again, our product is NPS. Um, but we're always enhancing what we do with that feedback. Um, so for me personally, uh, going back to my example of how I respond in real time, um, one of the things I love about our uh, about our um uh, uh, about our platform is that we can send out, um, you know, workflows. We can set up workflows, rather. So we can have, you know, if you have different scores, you can have different messages that go through, et cetera. Uh, but even as we get to a really large customer base, I personally um, like to respond to our, our lowest scores and our highest scores, personally, and have a different message each time that's actually actionable around what they're saying. Um, as a leader um, on, in the company and, and for the CS team, that's helped me a lot to understand the pain points enough to be able to evangelize um, these results. Uh, and I also try to meet with each customer to talk about the impact that their score had on us. Um, so, for example, one of the things that I uh, tend to say um, in my responses if they are a detractor or even a passive is, hey, I hear you. Um, I just want to personally thank you for taking the time to send your MPS score. Uh, it is so valuable in us building the business. I noticed that you gave us a, a score of a six. It looks like we have a, a, a lot of room for improvement. Uh, let's talk about how we get there. My, my suggestions would be, would be that we jump on a call and we go over best practices, uh, but just really speaking to the score. Uh, if there isn't feedback included with a score and it's just a number. Now, if there's feedback included, that makes it even easier, right? Because I can actually take what their pain points are uh, and make my response based on that. So perhaps it's uh, something that they would like to see increased in the product, and then I speak to that directly. Um, I had a customer recently ask for something that was on our product roadmap. So I let them know, hey, I'm going to talk personally to our product team and send your actual feedback comment to our head of product. Uh, however, the good news is other customers have brought this up as well, and we want to do something with it. So I, I think that um, a response, a simple response to what they're saying uh, is a great way to show that NPS does something inside your company, that it's not just a score that you put on a slide that you showed to a board of directors. Uh, so that's my personal experience, and I thank uh, Wendy and Michelle for going over those as well. So let's move on down. Um, still talking about that impact across the entire business because I feel like that's probably what's most important to most people listening in today. Um, so now let's dig a little deeper into the different operational functions of your organization. So how does a good process help customer success partner with and influence other functions of the business? Um, so uh, I'm going to start this time, if you don't mind, Wendy, uh, with maybe how it works with the different departments. You touched on this a little bit, uh, but maybe dig a little deeper into ways that sales, I'd love to hear more on sales, um, uses NPS, et cetera. So we're a pretty small company. There's only 30 of us, um, which I think makes process easier, um, and we'll have to make sure that we continue to focus on this as we grow um, and make sure that what we're doing today continues to scale. Um, but uh, I mentioned our, our feedback process and the way that the um, 
the product team uses uh, all of that feedback to continue to improve the product. Um, from the sales side, um, again, uh, I think the, the biggest place that we use this is with our enterprise deals. When we're um, on site and we're doing a, a pitch, um, it's one of the first things that we do when we're selling the customer success function. Um, we let customers know that customer success is um, something that we are obsessive about. Um, we usually send a customer success person to these deals to talk about how they're going to be responsible for taking care of the customer and NPS as part of that discussion. Um, I would say we could improve, um, you know, with our smaller deals. I don't think we do very much with it there, though the sales team um, gets really excited when they do see um, their, their deals come through with tens, um, and they offer feedback on why they they think that that customer is so happy. Um, you know, and one of the things that we're working to improve is our onboarding process. As the, as the product has grown, um, it's become more difficult to onboard our customers successfully. And so, um, you know, being able to use NPS at the end of that onboarding um, to make sure that we're setting the right expectations up front, I think is something that we're going to want to focus more on this year um, and be able to take those insights and move them all the way back to the expectations that we're setting in the marketing and sales um, part of the process. Um, we use our uh, promoters to identify possibilities for um, use cases and more marketing type materials that we can put on our website. We use all of that feedback. It's scattered across um, the different pages of our website. So everywhere you go, you'll see all of the promoter feedback that we've gotten. And then we also have a dedicated page to feedback that has, I think, like 400 customer quotes that we've gathered through MPS. Um, so it's really helped um, to take the voice of the customer and share it, um, even when customers are just starting to figure out who Fleetio is. Um, and then for operations, I don't have a really good example here. We don't hear a lot from our customers about um, really the operational aspects of the business. So um, that's something that we're going to be digging into this year, I think, more as well. That's fantastic. Um, sounds like even though you guys are 30 right now, that you are still using it across the board. And, you know, I found that sometimes even, you know, smaller companies, everybody's going a million miles an hour, right? And and so it's still a great conversation piece and a great way to connect everybody. So that's fantastic. Um, Michelle, I'm going to open it up to you. Um, obviously, you guys are, are a little bigger in size, so maybe you can uh, give us a peek into the size of that and how it works at scale. Um, as you and I have gone to a couple of functions and, and spoke on, you know, MPS together quite a, a few times, and I love how you guys use it for scale. Yeah, so um, we are a little bit larger than uh, Fleetio. We have, I believe we've just crossed the threshold of 130 employees. Um, but about three years ago, we were at Fleetio size. We were about 35 or 40. Um, and so the way that we use our, our MPS across the entire business, um, in some ways, is very, very similar to the way that, that Wendy described um, a little bit different for, for sales, though. Uh, we rely heavily on our MPS for, for customers that will give reference calls. Um, we, we have at Zapproved what we call the, the friends and family. They're, they're almost part-time employees. Um, it seems as though our longest, kind of most uh, biggest cheerleaders get, get asked to be reference calls for the sales team most often. Uh, we use our, our MTS survey to identify new customers that can be referenced on calls. It's helped us unlock uh, references and in industries that we previously didn't have. We were really heavy on references in oil and gas and insurance. Um, this has opened up the doors for pharmaceutical references and um, some additional other references where we were really lacking in that industry for sales. Um, Marketing, very similarly, we use our, our promoters to um, showcase. That, that's the way that we like to describe it. We're, we're showcasing successful partnerships, uh, case studies, logos on our website, testimonials. We'll bring customers in. We'll have them speak at events, uh, whether it be webinars or our annual conference. We really try to leverage our promoters not only to showcase the successful partnership between both of our organizations, but also showcase the fantastic work that our customers are doing. Uh, they're making such a great impact. Um, I didn't say this previously, but we work with litigation teams. So they're making incredibly big impacts on their business. And, and we want to showcase what 
their accomplishments are also. It's not just about our business. It's about the amazing things that our customers are doing every day. Um, with regards to the operations size, as we've scaled, we've brought on specialized roles, especially around contracts. Um, so, so we use our MPS heavily in our contracts process um, when it comes to, to price increases and contract renewals. Um, if, if someone's not really happy with feature functionality of the project or product, it's important that our finance team knows that so that they're not um, increasing subscription rates by 10%. Um, we, we use that, that MPS feedback all across our organization in every different department um, and, and really kind of use it as a, a warehouse for not only customers who, who are willing to, to put themselves out there for us, but also better ways we can put ourselves out there for our customers. Well, that is, um, that's fantastic. Um, and, you know, again, I thank you both for going over that. I think uh, it really depends. You kind of have to customize it for what makes most sense for your, for your company, no matter the size, uh, but that's fantastic. So listen, we're gonna go into our third poll um, so I'm going to pass that over again to Paula. Thanks so much, Leah. So this is the uh, third and final poll question. So if you could weigh in uh, now, that would be great. It's a simple uh, yes, no, or not your sure answer. We hope we're not giving you survey fatigue here. But uh, as I mentioned, this will be the last one. And while everybody is weighing in, um, I wanted to remind you once again that there's going to be a Q&A uh, session at the end. So if you have any questions, or you, uh, any questions pop up between now and the end of the presentation, feel free to input them into the platform, and I'll read them to our presenters at the conclusion of this event. I'm gonna go ahead and push the responses out. Leah, what do you think? Uh, wow, that's actually pretty exciting. Uh, and listen, I am going to time check here too and say I wanna to get to the Q&A, and I definitely, Wendy has like a really exciting uh, case study to go over with Fleetio, so I'm going to go through this a little quicker. Uh, but I am surprised. Like that is great that it's that it's becoming an operational tool. Uh, just to speak on it real quick, personally, um, you know, I I feel like NPS is something that you can use not only to show you know improve performance across the board for your organization, for your products, et cetera, uh, but it's also something you can use as a you know KPI, a key performance indicator. Uh, for your customer success team, for your product, right? Um, and so there's a lot you can do there. Um, and hopefully today we've gone over a few ways that you can use that. But maybe food for thought based on this and seeing that there's 42.1% that, that don't or aren't sure an additional 15.8%, maybe that'd be a cool next uh, webinar, right, to discuss how you can use uh, NPS to improve your performance even more. Uh, and I also think there's some golden nuggets that you're going to find uh, in Wendy's presentation as well. So I'm going to skip on down and speed through the next few slides a little faster than I've gone on the other ones. Um, and we're going to talk about the impact again across the entire business and how it's a competitive advantage, right? My favorite thing is I'm just going to be honest with you, I am very competitive. So I want to be the best at CS, I want our, our team to be the best, I want our company to be the best, and I think NPS really helps us by doing that. Um, it enables that proactive mindset that we discussed in, in great detail earlier on, um, but it also helps you do things like develop a playbook. Um, and that's something that you know, your sales team can have where you're developing a competitive advantage based on the feedback that you're getting. Um, there's the cross-functional processes that put you ahead of your competition. Uh, and then, you know, of course, the you know, getting your brand um, to a place where customers, the most important part, evangelize it for you. So again, talking about those promoters, your nines and tens, you know, they're out there doing marketing for you. And, and that's word of mouth, right? Going out there and talking great things about the experience that they've had with your company. So, um, so those are a few of the big things for me to point out for the competitive advantage. Let me quickly go over to Michelle. Do you have anything additional that you want to add there? Um, I think you about covered it. The only thing I'd add, I mean, at the end of the day, we're all part of businesses. There is a, a bottom line. Turning those customers into raving advocates helps the bottom line. It lowers your customer acquisition costs. It increases customer lifetime value. Um, it should be important across the entire organization, and it should have impact because everyone benefits when everyone cares. Everyone wins when everyone wins, right? Simple math. 
Uh, Wendy, anything else that you want to add there? No, I think you both said uh, everything that I was thinking, so I agree. Fantastic. All right, so moving on down uh, to the next part of this. So same subject, but different angle to look at it. Um, you know, again, how has your business achieved a shift in focus to customer obsession? I think we've covered this well, um, but I want to open it up to, um, we'll start with Wendy this time, any additional advice that you would get before we get into uh, your case study and your experience with Flidio, any additional advice um, around NPS that we haven't covered today uh, that you think would be helpful? No, the only, the only thing I would uh, remind everybody is what Leah said just a few minutes ago, this is a company-wide measure. Um, a lot of times, I think when people start to do NPS, people sort of look at it and say, well, it only applies to customer success, and that's not the case. Um, and so evangelize early, evangelize wide, make sure that everybody understands their role in that NPS score and how they can impact it and continue um, to, to, to share that number, socialize that number, and make sure that the entire team feels like they can um, do things to, to drive that number up. It's very important that people don't just say, oh, well, we have a low score, CS must not be doing their job because, it, you know, it is a company-wide measurement. So. Oh, that's such a good point. And music to my ears, right? Like it is a it's a company uh, situation, right? Like an NPS score is everything because it's asking a simple question of would you recommend? And if you're not going to recommend a company that you purchase something at or that you are a client of, um, there is way more to it than a than a simple experience you had with the services team, right? Which is why I love NPS above like CSAT scores and everything because it's the whole company. It's how you feel about it. You know, it's like friends recommending, you know, uh, recommending a product that they love. You know, would you recommend uh, this certain shampoo, et cetera? You're not going to recommend it unless you love it, right? And so I think that's such a good point. You don't go back and say, you know, it goes down to one person or one team. Uh, it's a company thing. So, Michelle, anything else on your side? No, I think you guys have both about covered it. Okay, fantastic. So one more thing I want to say before we pass it over to Wendy is this NPS everywhere. So I love the idea of having NPS everywhere. We've talked about it today, how it can be everywhere in real time. Uh, but I want us to remember that this is, in, this is internal, right? NPS is in the D, if, if done correctly, NPS is in the DNA of your organization from your, uh, you know, from your customer success team to your sales team to your marketing team for sure on those advocates, right? Um, and then all the way down to your interns, uh, entering that might be helping with support and technical issues up to your C-suite and beyond, uh, even down to marketing campaigns and end users that, that become future customers. What NPS everywhere doesn't mean is that you're overly NPS scoring the end user, right? And so um, I think that's one important metric that we didn't touch on too much, and I want to say that is definitely something that here at Ask Nicely we can help with. Uh, there's a lot of collateral that we have um, from our uh, for our our NPS uh, book that we wrote that is something that uh, you know you guys can access as well, uh, and we'll go over that at the end where you can find some of that collateral. But it's really important to also know when, where, and how to uh, to send those NPS scores out to individuals where they're not being overly spammed by it. Uh, so we might touch on that more in the Q&A. If not, I'll wrap it up at the end where we discuss that a little bit. Um, but with that being said, I'm going to pass this over now, pass the uh, invisible mic over to Wendy to discuss uh, NPS in action in the Fleetio story and her experience. Wendy, if you don't mind, taking it from here. Sure. So I think I've mentioned uh, that I started with Lydia about a year and a half ago, um, and we did not have a customer success team when I joined. Um, we're very small. Um, and so one of the first things that I was tasked to do is just wrap my head around how are our customers feeling. And we had over a thousand customers at the time. And so, it, uh, you know, it was impossible for me to pick up the phone and call every single one and, and say, hey, tell me how you're feeling, you know, what's going on with Fleetio, and, you know, what can we do to improve your experience? So we needed a way to really do that at scale and start to gather information very quickly. Um, and we were in the process of, of um, installing a customer success management tool so we could get health scores and early warning alerts, but that was a, a much bigger project. And, 
we needed something, again, that we could start uh, really uh, taking action on very quickly, and we knew that NPS was a really great way to start to get that information. So uh, we started looking around at the NPS tools that were out there, and um, I had a really great experience with the Ask Nicely sales team. They were incredibly helpful and supported me in getting the system set up, answered the questions that I had, and we were up and running within a, like a couple of days, and that was really only because um, we were testing a couple of things and uh, needed some time to sort of check in on, um, you know, what the different data points that were coming back were, um, but uh, pretty quickly settled on Ask Nicely, and I think we were sending our surveys, you know, within a couple of days of making that decision and starting to see data that was coming back in from customers. Um, and so from there, it was really easy for me to start to understand, um, you know, which were the customers that were unhappy, who needed my attention first, who could I reach out to to start understanding, um, you know, why they were giving us those low scores. Um, and so I was able to really start to wrap my head around our customer base very, very quickly. Um, prior to that, we had just been sending um, really CSAT scores uh, during the customer support process. And, uh, you know, that, those weren't, they were really helpful for us to understand how our customer support team interactions were going, but they were not telling us how our customers were really feeling about um, about Fleetio. And so um, this was, again, a really great way for us to start to understand that. Uh, we immediately started pushing those results into Slack. And at the beginning, really, it was just kind of me and the CEO that would have conversations around the, uh, the data that was coming in. And every once in a while, um, you know, a salesperson would pop in and say, like, oh, I find that customer. That's so exciting. Um, but we started really socializing the um, – the program at all of our All Minds meetings, we would share that score at the top of the the, um, the customer success presentation with the caveat every single time that this was a number that the company owned. And pretty soon we started to see the activity in our Slack channel pick up dramatically. And the product team would start to comment in on, um, you know, feature-related feedback, and the sales team would comment in on the expectation setting type things that we were seeing. Um, and it was a really easy way for everybody to start getting involved. Um, and we've even seen um, really great examples. Um, like last week, somebody gave us an eight, and their feedback was around the way that our algorithms on our Fleetio Drive product worked. And the product manager for that uh, product hopped in, and the CEO hopped in, and they had a conversation and agreed that those algorithms could be improved. And uh, they're going to be pushing that uh, functionality out uh, for that customer in the next couple of days. So um, I think with everybody uh, sort of seeing what our customers are saying, what are thinking, it's um, having a really great impact on the way that we can respond to those requests. Um, again, we've set up workflows that make it really easy for um, our promoters to go out to Captera and respond there. And uh, because of that, we've seen our Captera reviews go through the roof. Um, customers are really starting to engage with us and help us with that, um, with that process. Um, again, for our detractors, uh, I asked them to set up a 15-minute call with me, so it's a really great way for them on their own time, on their own terms, to reach out and share more information with me. Um, it allows me to research, um, you know, the requests that they've sent that maybe they don't think they're getting attention on or other um, items maybe that they've sent in to support that they didn't really feel uh, were being paid attention to. And we can resolve those things very, very quickly. And at the end of the call, um, you know, customers are already happier and ready to give us a higher score. Um, so uh, it's been a really easy way uh, for us to, again, understand how our customers are feeling at scale, take action on that, um, share those pieces of feedback with the entire company, and make sure that everybody's rallying around that score um, every single day. All right, fantastic. And I'm just going to skip through. Uh, did a didn't flip through that while you were speaking, but we had an extra slide on that. So thank you so much. I think that's incredibly valuable and obviously exciting uh, for me to hear um, on our side um, and um, hopefully for all the listeners as well. So we've got about, what, eight minutes left, if I'm doing math correctly. So um, I want to jump into the Q&A session. Uh, and the reason for that is I was thinking about giving us about five minutes, but we actually have some really good questions that came in. Um, so I'm going to read through a few of these that have come in, and uh, we'll kind of just pass it around casually between myself and Michelle and Wendy on our insights and answers into this. Um, 
So it looks like the first question that I have pulled up here is what delivery channels do you use for your NPS surveys? Ah, that's a great question uh, and definitely one we should touch on. Um, do you want, Michelle, do you mind if I start with you on that one? No, I don't What delivery at all. channels um, do you use for your NPS? Currently, we just um, use email. Our customer base probably wouldn't be as receptive to SMS or automated voice. Um, so we rely heavily on email. Most of the time, they're glued to their cell phones anyway, uh, which makes it odd that they wouldn't be receptive to SMS, but uh, email is most accessible for us. Fantastic. Uh, Wendy, anything different on your side beyond email? Uh, we are yeah, we're, um, we just, about a week ago, implemented the web survey portion of Ask Nicely, and so we're testing that out right now to see if that's a way that we can get more engagement with our customers, but mostly just email at this point. Yeah, fantastic. Listen, again, this kind of goes down to what makes the most sense for your business, right? Um, so oftentimes, the best practice, email. Email is a fantastic way to get the MPS survey. Um, but in-app and, and what you're talking about with on the website itself, uh, depending on your business model, um, I, have a, I have a couple of customers with Ask Nicely who they, they have a lot of reasons why their customers go back to their website. And that's a, that's a perfect example of where an app would be valuable is, you know, this, these are customers that go back to the website maybe to get information, maybe to upload videos in the case of one of our customers. And so it's just a fantastic way uh, to get that, uh, that score out there or that survey rather out there for those that, that it makes sense. Um, but really, my advice on this one, on the delivery channel, would be to um, to speak with someone, to speak to a customer service representative of, of who you're using as your MPS provider, uh, to really discuss that with you and go over what's the best practice for your business. All right. So uh, let's go on. Oh, and I do want to say one last thing. Uh, email has proven to be the best response rate. So just FYI, good to know, email is the, the front runner for response rate. Okay, so we've got a, another great question here. How do you sell the importance of MPS to everyone? Oh, that is a great question, right? Um, it's super easy for a customer success team to be able to say MPS is an important metric, but how do you sell this down to your product team? How do you sell this down to uh, the different, uh, you know, parts of your business? Because again, to what we talked about today, if everybody isn't bought in, it can be really challenging. Um, so I know we've touched on this a little bit, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and open it up. We'll start with Wendy this time. Any advice on ways to get people excited about MPS and, and to get more people bought in? Yeah, so I mean, I think we're already getting a lot of that information from our customers. We're getting product feedback. We're getting feedback on our services, um, you know, and, and so being able to attach a happiness number to it um, just sort of helps. Uh, let the other, you know, the other teams in your company know why that information is, is important. It helps, um, be able to prioritize the things that we need to work on and it helps us understand, um, you know, when we do make changes or when we do adjust, uh, certain parts of our business, what impact that has on our customers. We can see that immediately in our scores. And so be able to tie that that very um, tangible, very physical number to the information that you're already getting probably anyway, and using that to prioritize your work um, is a great way to sell it to your team. Okay, Wendy, happiness number might be my new favorite phrase in the world. <laughs> that is fantastic. I want shirts made. That is such a good, that it's so simple and perfect, happiness number. Uh, Michelle, anything additional you want to add there? Um, I think as as that you were asking that question, um, I think back to I'd maybe been with Approved for six or seven months, and I had just taken over our MPS program, and we had had our first conversion from a passive to a promoter, and this person went from a seven to a nine, so just a small jump. But I remember how excited our entire customer success team was about it, and how we had shared that um, that feedback with our product team. And so I think using a milestone like that where it says, hey, like the work that we do on this actually does make a difference. I think that is big. So we're big on sharing milestones. So we can take someone who maybe has given us a, a three or a four, and even if we bring them up to a six, like that's, that's fantastic. Um, not all detractors are the same. So someone who gives you a zero is very different than someone who gives you a six. So giving – 
even those small milestones, celebrating those, like celebrate the wins within your company. And I think that the MPS sells itself that way. That's awesome. Hey, Michelle, can I personally challenge you to use uh, the phrase happiness number at least three times today? You can, but I'm working from home, so I don't have anyone to say it to. <laughs> Man, all right. Well, I'm going to use it. It's my word of the day. Uh, okay, listen, uh, we are we are almost out of time, um, so I, I do want to quickly say the last thing on here is are we over-surveying? Um, I want to say that, again, we have some extremely valuable information on this. Uh, in our new MPS, the book on MPS um, that Ask Nicely has available where we really break this out. Um, this is also something that you can reach out to me, uh, Leah at asknice.ly. I'm happy to answer these questions. Um, but with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Paula to wrap us up. And I just want to thank you guys one last time. I want to thank uh, Wendy. I want to thank Michelle for being just awesome. You guys are great people to collaborate with on this on this stuff. And thank you for joining us this afternoon. And thank you to everybody that, that has listened in today as well. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks to the audience members for joining us and all our speakers. And thanks again to our sponsor, Ask Nicely. Uh, have a great day, everybody.